Welcome to our lecture here. So it's a pleasure for me to introduce the speaker today, who is also the winner of the 2019 ICA Early Career Award, that's Professor Jeremy Bois. He received this fine award for his outstanding contributions to media technologies and smart hearing protection towards advanced communication systems and hearing help monitoring devices, what we call hearables, you'll hear about that. For example, using in-ear brain computation as well as utilizing photoacoustic emissions, which are generated in the inner ear and can be recorded in the ear canal and also applied in various aspects. Jeremy has, in fact, uh, already 20 years of experience in occupational noise control. Um, he has contributed to more than 100 scientific publications, both journals and conferences. He has more than a dozen uh, awarded patents. He has contributed to uh, several American, Canadian, and ISO standards. He is currently uh, president of the Canadian Acoustical Association and associate director at the Center for Internet Interdisciplinary Research in Music Media and Technology at McGill University in Toronto. He's also associate member of the International Laboratory for Brain, Music and Sound Research, or BAMS. And on top of that, he's director of the International Institute of Acoustics and Vibration, located at Auburn University in Alabama, uh, US. His background is actually in physics and acoustics. He uh, received his uh, master's in physics from the University of Leeds in France, and also a master's afterwards in acoustics from the University of uh, Leeds in 1997. He then uh, got a PhD in acoustics from the École Technologie Supérieure in Montreal. And then in 2010, he uh, became associate professor in Montreal. And since 2018, he's a good professor at the École Technologie Supérieure in Montreal. So this is impressive and quite a lot. Even more so, given that this is just that he just received this early career award, so uh, it will be exciting to see what's what's going to happen in the future um, uh, with all your upcoming activities and achievements. But right now, for this moment, we are looking very much forward uh, to your presentation, and which will be about the year at the age of Internet of Things. So the floor is yours. Congratulations again for your award, and thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, hello. Thank you very much, Torsten, for that, um, that nice introduction, very nice introduction. So clearly, I'm here um, in front of you giving you that keynote uh, lecture because I received that early career award. And uh, the reason I'm saying that is not only because I'd like to brag about that, I'm really proud of it and uh, really uh, appreciative of uh, ICA recognition. But it's also because in that very room, there are a lot of experts in the various uh, topics I'll be covering and surfing over. So. Uh, the floor could have been yours, but not today. So um, I'll be um, reaching my clicker. And um, I'm a full professor at the University of Quebec in Montreal. And I lead what we call an industrial research chair. So this is half funded by a federal agency called the National Science and Engineering Research Council, and half by a private company out of Montreal called EERS, E-E-R-S. And together, we relieve our quest is really to develop a bionic ear. So we are in, indeed interested in all the in-ear technologies, what can be done in the ear, around the ear, on top of uh, simply uh, listening, obviously. So for that uh, talk today, I'd like to divide all those in-ear technologies in five large areas. And starting on the left, oh, sorry, starting on the, on the right, with what is obvious, the need for hearing protection. So you realize that the ear is a very sensitive place. It's uh, very fragile and needs to be protected against the risk of noise-induced hearing loss. And this is especially true in the industry where I'm coming from, where there are a lot of workers being losing their hearing over too loud exposures for too long. Then, and I'm going clockward, I will be discussing about communication in noise. This is still a very large issue that is still unaddressed uh, for a lot of workers uh, in industry. That's as well unaddressed. If I look at yesterday's very fine reception, you can see that you know, communicating in noise can be uh, as well a struggle. So that's for a lot of people as well. And then... Yeah. 
I cannot get really closer. Uh, is there any audio AV guy here? Otherwise, I'll move to the. Uh, is this one better? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. So we'll move to the. Uh, so the third one will be the biosensing. Biosensing, and I'll try to convince you that the ear and the ear canal is actually a very nice place to collect a lot of uh, information about the body and actually to connect the human beings with machines. And then we'll look into the way how we can stimulate the ear. So obviously by sound, that's the given, but you can see that there are other uh, media that can be used. And finally, harvesting, that will be the idea that we can probably collect some energy from inside the ear canal, and I'll show you how. So I have actually 18 uh, in-ear technologies that I'd like to, uh, to present you quickly. And we'll be starting uh, with the very first and obvious one, which is uh, hearing protection. So again, hearing protection is really critical, not only for our industry, you know that we have been exposed more and more, and I think we had that uh, from the very first keynote uh, given by Marion uh, Burger, Burgess. Sorry. Um, we have been exposed, we are exposed to more and more noise and need to be protected from a lot of recreational noise as well. So obviously the collective uh, noise control at the source is a good uh, measure, but sometimes you have to protect workers or individuals. So for that, passive hearing protectors are required, and they need to be comfortable so that people wear them, they need to be effective so that people are protected, and they need to you know, maintain those properties over time. So I'm a personally a big believer into what we call custom molded ear molds, so you can see them on the, on the left. And those uh, very uh, ear molds were actually manufactured by a unique process that is uh, used using the headband that you see on the right. So you may be familiar with the fact that when you want to get a custom ear mold, you typically uh, take an ear impression mechanically or you do scan nowadays. But anyway, you uh, have to take a mold of that ear canal and then you uh, do a cast and do um, the real imprint. Here the idea is slightly different. We will be injecting directly inside the ear canal using that headband that contains a pump. So just to show you that little animation to help you. The oops, missed. Sorry, it's a lot of uh, microphone and uh, hanging here. Missed again. <clears throat> so here's the uh, dispenser that you see on the head. It's a head mounted. And when you release the action, there's a mechanical spring that will be actually releasing uh, some liquid silicone rubber that will fill a membrane inside the ear canal that will inflate and fit to the exact shape of the ear canal and cure in three minutes. So after three minutes, you can remove that and you have a solid earpiece that is made to your unique shape. So that's a process that has been used and developed you know, almost uh, 10 or 12 years ago. That has been used intensively in the industry and is now uh, required uh, for some very specific industries like mining uh, in uh, South Africa and Australia, I, I believe. When you have such an earpiece, the question is, well, how good is that? And so that was really the research question I had uh, during my PhD is, well, can we test the fit of a hearing protector, because you know, if the fit is not good, you don't get any attenuation, hence no protection. So the very simple idea I started with, uh, with was to uh, instrument the earpiece and using a dual element microphone, you can see the probe mic with the two microphones in green, and sliding that inside the custom earpiece and measuring across the earpiece the sound attenuation, basically, in the presence of a broadband uh, noise source. So that system got later uh, acquired by a 3M, and you can see here a worker that is being tested, so facing a loudspeaker, having the pro microphones, and here he's being uh, tested over disposable earplugs. So not only custom earplugs, but all earplugs can now be tested, uh, at least by 3M, using this kind of technology. And so that was actually a tremendous uh, commercial success, but what I'm really proud of is the fact that it actually changed a lot uh, the regulation and the way the hearing conservation programs are run at least in North America. So nowadays, uh, when people are doing uh, uh, hearing conservation programs or hearing loss prevention program, as we call them, they do imp include often fit testing as a very first and required action for proper qualification and training of the workforce. And the second thing that I'm quite proud of as well is that we finally uh, had approved a new standard, which is a NCS 12.71, that actually defines how all those fit testing systems can be uh, certified in terms of measurement uncertainty. Because obviously I just showed you one system that I worked on, but there are a lot of systems nowadays in the field, and it's important to understand how accurate they are and how precise uh, their measurement is. So let's go back a little bit to the, uh, to the earpiece, and since the ear is really meant originally to listen to things, you can uh, 
think of simply including inside that ear mold, inside that earpiece, just a little miniature loudspeaker. So this is something that we did uh, back in the days as well with uh, ears. And there were, although we did a, you know, a great, I think, acoustical design in terms of transfer function, having transparency, uh, modeling for the occluded ear canal and so on, uh, and we got actually a quite a uh, couple of recognition uh, that never went as a very good uh, commercial success. And I think we learned a lesson is that sometimes the, you know, having good science and good uh, technology is not enough. You need the, the good marketing, and it was probably not uh, the, the case in, the, in those days. So that's uh, still... <clears throat> interesting product and that makes me move to how we came back to industry. So we came back to industry saying, well, there is much more we can do really for industry uh, moving away from the consumer market. And one of the things that is very critical when you want to protect workers is to make sure uh, that they, don't, uh, they are not exposed, overexposed to noise. So to do that, the best way is actually to measure that residual noise exposure and why not measuring that inside the ear. So inside the ear means that you would be putting a microphone under the earpiece inside the occluded ear canal. So this is what we do here with, um, and I'll show you the little uh, the video again of the uh, instrumented digital earpiece that we, we designed. So you can see here the loudspeakers I mentioned already, and here there will be an extra uh, microphone that will be used, and they are tubed uh, to conduct and to uh, channel the uh, the sound and uh, included into a compound, an acoustical material. And you can add on top of that an external microphone that will be used. And you can have in between some connections and PCB electronic to uh, do the electronic, uh, electronic connections. And that becomes really the electroacoustic earpiece that will be used uh, for all our research and to measure that in ear uh, sound exposure. We can use the behind the ear compartment and have some electronic digital signal processing uh, batteries and the like, or use a wired connection uh, if that's needed. So with this kind of platform, we develop a lot of uh, <coughs> technologies, but really coupling them with the earpiece that you've seen before, which is that instant custom molded uh, earpiece uh, that we can fit in three minutes. So with this platform, we can obviously um, do uh, research and measure accurately the, uh, the in-ear dose. I won't go into too much details for now, but that's something that we do um, very um, efficiently, I believe. Now that we have uh, this outer ear microphone and this internal loudspeaker, one thing that can be as well uh, considered is how we can make that earplug a little bit smart and letting only the useful signal get through. So when you're a worker, you're mostly interested in useful signals that are the speech, the warning signals, and you want to be protected from the toxic noise. And one way to do that is really to use the digital signal processor that is inside the earpiece and simply having the green microphone, which is the outside microphone, and the red loudspeaker, which is the internal receiver, and simply filtering. So this is a single channel uh, filtering approach. You could remove some of the noise. So this is very basic uh, techniques that have been used widely in the hearing aid industry for ages. And here I'll just give you a little demonstration of a uh, modulation-based digital noise reduction. So this is, uh, the voice will be in noise. I'll give you first the voice segment uh, clean, then with a zero dB uh, uh, or plus five dB SNR, and then denoise with um, an MBDNR uh, algorithm. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. The birch canoe slid on the smooth planks. So the quality of the uh, signal you do get through those kind of uh, noise reduction really depends on the processing power that you do have. You know, the best or the better and the faster the DSP, uh, the better the denoising is. And obviously, denoising is not often enough. You need sometimes to have as well uh, an increase in the intelligibility, which is uh, still a challenge. So, but now if you are dealing with fast processors that are able to uh, generate uh, fast uh, responses, you can as well consider uh, using uh, implementing active noise control. So active noise control is the idea that you can cancel locally the sound pressure level by sending a wave that is of opposite um, phase and same magnitude as the disturbance you want to cancel. And the typical application we do have uh, for workers and very special workers that are professional musicians is that professional musicians are workers that rely on their ears to do their job, to earn their livings. They need to be protected, but they need to be uh, you know, in a nice sounding environment. So the thing that they hate 
first is often what we call the occlusion effect. So this is this sensation that you do have when you have an earplug in the ear and you're singing or performing an instrument that touches the skull. You have that bone conduction path that actually uh, creates a huge boomy effect and you hear yourself way too loud and you don't hear your colleagues so nicely. So if you were able to cancel that occlusion effect using active noise control, you would definitely uh, you know, help them a lot. And this is what we tried to do with uh, one of my PhD students. And I will leave you uh, with Antoine for three minutes. He will uh, have you travel inside his ear and experience a little bit of this active noise control of his occlusion effect uh, while he's wearing uh, the device. For musicians, you are currently hearing me through the inside microphone of the earpiece so that when I wear them, you can hear what's going on inside my ear canals and you can hear what I hear. So before I wear them, I want to show you how loud the music that I'll be using is. So I definitely have to raise my voice and this is really a situation where I would want to wear some HPD, so I'm going to do it. And... Welcome to my ear canal. So, uh, you're hearing me uh, as I hear myself right now, and that's definitely very boomy. So, uh, as I turn the active reduction up and down, you should hear the low frequency content of my voice uh, reach more natural levels. So, let me turn it up, and the boominess has gone away for me. And let, it, let me uh, turn it back down, and the boominess is back. So, just umming. Mm, it's back up. Mm, and it's back down. Uh, so, let me uh, turn it back up. So, now, um, if I uh, play some music and turn the active noise reduction up and down, you should hear the low frequency content of the music go up and down. So, right now, it is more balanced. And if I turn it down, becomes more boomy and back up and back down okay uh, let me turn it back up so now i'm going to show you uh the effect of raising the volume from the outer ear microphone so i increase the volume and this allows me to obtain a variable attenuation so uh, let me turn it to unity gain. So this feels very natural to me. And now I'm going to turn it down. Till it goes away. So let me put some music. I can now select the level of the Maya generation. Okay. And then last but not least, uh, there is an auxiliary input so that the sound engineer could send me a monitor mix. So say I was a singer and this was my live microphone, I could have some of this sent back directly inside my ears and use the outside microphone, uh, still use the outside microphone of my earpiece to hear what's going on around me and be connected to the crowd. So let me demo that. Uh, I'm just gonna raise the auxiliary input. And now this microphone is sent back directly to my mix inside my ears. And if I speak into it, I can have an ideal situation for me to perform. So let me turn the ANC back off again. Thank you. All right, so I think that uh, clearly illustrates you know, the benefits of this active noise control for the occlusion effect. And the benefits for non-musicians is that when you're wearing a device, now suddenly you don't hear all those you know, body noises that you typically have. If you have been ever experiencing that, and if you're running with something inside your ear, you may hear your footsteps very loud. Uh, just the, all the mechanical movements on the arm, hand will be conducted and so on. So this is really beneficial as well uh, in the industry. So if we really want to protect workers and you know, anybody wearing those devices uh, well, we have to monitor the exposure they've been exposed to, the noise exposure and this is what we did with the in-ear dosimetry. But another thing we can do is uh, see how much that noise affects or not their hearing. So for that, there has been um, a clinical measurement developed uh, back in the days, which is called the autoacoustic emission. 
And this is really a property that I will illustrate in a minute, that when you are sending tones, pure tones, for example, to the uh, cochlea, the outer air cells in the cochlea will actually uh, try to amplify those tones, and doing this, they will create a distortion product, intermodulation distortion, that can be actually recorded inside the uh, ear canal. So if we send two tones, that I'm going to do now, and I will just reduce the level for you. If I send an F1 frequency, an F2 frequency, and then the two together, what will happen is that your ear will respond that third tone. So it's a very faint uh, st uh, signal. It's barely above the background noise, but the thing is that we know exactly where it will, help. It will uh, take place. So we can really denoise that signal and record that, and that gives us an indication of your hearing status. So it's not perfect. There has been a long, long, uh, long of, a lot of uh, studies on, you know, is there any normative data on that, and there is not. So it has to be really individualized, but one thing you can do is really track that. So this is why we call it monitoring. We monitor that distortion product as you are exposed during the day, and if we see any change in that F3 response, we know that maybe you had too much noise, and you're fatigued, and maybe that will lead to a hearing loss eventually, so you're, uh, you should be uh, taken care of. So here, the um, system autoacoustic emission is used widely for newborn screening. This is a very convenient way to test the peripheral system uh, for a newborn. But here, uh, and it's typically used in very calm environment, clinical environment or hospital environment. Here, what we did is that we succeeded uh, to uh, denoise using the uh, external microphone of both uh, the uh, ipsilateral and contralateral uh, earpieces. And so we are able to measure those uh, DPOAs in very, well, in a 70 or 75 dB A environment, meaning that we can do that in industry, in the real world, uh, during the work shift of the work. So that's a clear indication. Now that we know if the worker has been fatigued or not, now that we know the exposure level, we are able to combine the two and come up with what we call the individual susceptibility of a given individual to develop noise-induced hearing loss. So that's, uh, the, that's it for the uh, hearing protection. And if we move to another area, which is unfortunately uh, taking a lot of um, place in industry as well, is that you already have workers that are suffering from some kind of hearing loss. So those people need to be aided, because if you pass speech, they won't necessarily understand or hear it properly, and they need to pr be protected at the same time. Here I won't go too deep inside uh, hearing aid uh, technologies, there are a lot of experts uh, in this very room, but uh, just to mention that things are changing fast, I think, in this market, and the fact that uh, in the United States, two years ago, the Congress actually deregulated uh, the access to the hearing aid, uh, changed a little bit the things, although it's not completely clear yet, but um, in the way that this uh, over-the-shelf hearing aid act enables any manufacturer of consumer products to feature hearing amplification or hearing aid in their products. So what I'm telling you is that there are a lot of companies working on this, and there will be really, in a very short period of time, a lot of features that will be built in any headphones or um, uh, Bluetooth uh, earpiece that you'll buy for your cell phone and so on that will feature those kind of uh, hearing amplification that's starting at least in the United States, and I'm, I wouldn't be surprised that it, uh, for Europe will actually uh, follow as well. And our goal uh, within the research chair is obviously to merge that hearing protection with the hearing aid and having the two work together to protect uh, for every worker their residual uh, hearing. Now, the third topic was the communication in noise. And you realize that in industry, often, you cannot just rely on the acoustical uh, exchange and the speech uh, signal, sometimes you have to send that over distance and sometimes using walkie-talkies or personal radio communication systems. And obviously if you're doing this uh, noise in a noisy environment, you have a lot of contamination. So one of the ideas uh, here was to simply capture the speech, not from the microphone in front of my mouth, but to capture that from the inside the ear. So you realize that inside the ear when you're speaking and you heard Antoine, you hear the voice very present, it's very amplified by this occlusion effect. It's very boomy, you heard that. But what we tried here with uh, Rachel was to actually de, uh, well, denoise that uh, speech and enhance it. So here you'll have a little demonstration. You'll hear first uh, the, the uh, clean reference signal, and then in the noise, that's 0 dB SNR. 
So here is the clean speech. The birch canoe lives on the smooth plank. And then in industry that sounds like this. So what's present inside the ear of Rachel? It's residual noise and boomy. We'll remove the residual noise. It's still boomy. We'll enhance recreating some high frequency missing information. This is what we get. If we compare to the original, the virtual That was crystal clear, but still, in, in terms of integrity, what we do get is comparable the virtual and can be used in industry. So this is actually a life-changing uh, uh, situation because you may realize that there are uh, a lot of noise industry, and that's especially true in Canada, where we have a lot of mines and uh, wood and um, different uh, oil and gas uh, industries. So this is definitely heavy industries that are really noisy. And you know, when you're uh, doing mining, there is not much you can do in terms of noise control. You know, if you have to extract the, you know, the, the gold, that has to be, uh, <coughs> has to be uh, noisy. And uh, you know, communication in those noisy environments is challenging and can be very challenging if not you're wearing a face mask. Because if you're wearing a face mask because you're a man, it's very complicated. So one of the advantages of uh, having the in-ear microphone is that you can still protect the ear but you protect the lungs as well because people don't have to lift their face mask or gas mask to work in those very uh, heavy uh, industrial environments. Third topic was the bio signal, bio sensing. So we said that there was this microphone inside the ear and we realized that it can be measuring the speech, capturing that speech information. What you may uh, realize is that it will be capturing everything that happens inside the ear and all those physiological noise can be sometimes meaningful. So here's the, here's the animated the spectrogram of uh, one low frequency signal. So this is quite a good sound system here because you heard that uh, signal which is ranging from 10 to 35 hertz and it's really the sound of your heartbeat inside the occluded ear canal. So that was without any machinery noise, but you realize that machine noise does not necessarily go that low and does not necessarily have that uh, you know, pulsation or temporal um, attitude. So it's very possible to extract your heartbeat rate just with the microphone inside the ear. Just <clears throat> that, like, you know that the um, reading of a heartbeat inside the ear canal is something that has been demonstrated a while ago. You may, um, I think this is the very first time that was demonstrated, that was, uh, I think, at MIT, um, the, um, just using the photoplasticography, uh, you had a PPG system, so you basically measure the near-infrared near uh, reflectance of uh, a device inside the ear canal. And here you can see that the signal that you do get, which is on the top, which is the ear PPG, is very well correlated with what you would get on a finger or with what you would get on a chest electrocardiogram, conventional electrocardiogram. So you do have uh, accurate and uh, reliable information inside the air canal, and that can even be extracted only with a microphone. And from that, for example, peak-to-peak -peak, uh, values, you can do some you know, time frequency analysis. And here is uh, one that we call the heart rate variability. And that actually is able to assess the stress level of your wearer. So just using those, this information here, this is the, you can see the power density of that HRV that tells you that in this experiment, the people were more relaxed because of the music they had been listening to. So this is the kind of uh, metric you can get out of those uh, bio signals. One thing you can do very conveniently inside the air canal is recording the temperature. So this is um, something you're familiar with uh, when you're uh, going to the doctor. You can record the humidity. So this is very useful for us, for example, to monitor workers under mine that are maybe uh, under a stress wave or a heat uh, uh, stress. And uh, this is something you can uh, do quite conveniently. What you may not realize is that I, if I'm monitoring your ear canal uh, temperature continuously, I can get very you know, original applications like this one, which is clearly for women. That's um, a fertility uh, monitor that actually monitors your temperature and tries to detect when the ovulation uh, peaks uh, or ovulation happens and uh, can be used as a, as a wearable. So that's a commercial product with a, a typical application. 
Another atypical application, but which is really using back again the in-ear microphone and in-ear speaker, you can measure the transfer function of this occluded ear and assess some of the mobility, for example, of the inner ear uh, ossicles. And basically here, that's a very uh, funny, I thought, uh, way to detect middle ear inf uh, infections. And you see that here, the, uh, this is University of Washington. I think they just used that cell phone. You see the speaker and the microphone are funneled together into a little paper cone, and they can assess or claim to assess any infections in uh, toddlers uh, with this uh, device. So again, this is something that we can do in the earpiece quite uh, easily, as we do have all those uh, electro acoustic uh, sensors. Now, if I'm adding another type of sensor, which is a mechanical sensor, which we call the initial measurement unit, so an IMU measures the acceleration and the velocity, and as well the um, angular with the north, magnetic north. So and you can actually uh, have inside the ear now a very precise localization of the head, because you realize that the ear and the head are moving together, uh, hopefully. And, uh, well, and both at the same time, so which is actually good because you have some redundancy. So you can have two sensors that are measuring the same solid body motion, and you can from there detect a lot of the uh, head movements and even body movements. So that's important for us uh, if you want to detect some motion in the, uh, for workers that are uh, subject to repetitive movements. You can imagine applications where you had silent interface and you're over the phone and you're just nodding and this is things that can be displayed on the, on the cell phone like a happy face, you're okay with the, these conversations. Uh, the very first, I think, application was again, uh, this is uh, yeah, a German, I think, research where they first integrated that into hearing aid and the idea was to detect when uh, an elderly per person would actually fall down and this is very useful. Uh, not to mention that in industry, this is very uh, critical. We have what we call man down detectors. So they are detecting for first responders or uh, firefighters, mostly, sometimes military, detecting that somebody is on the floor and needs to be uh, taken out by his uh, pails. And that's uh, typically the, the kind of uh, application we recently uh, published. Now, there are other physiological uh, information that is able, available for free in this ear canal. And uh, one of them that we looked uh, recently uh, is what we call non-verbal information. So this is all those non-speech uh, sounds that are present in the ear canal and that tells you a lot. So you've been hearing me now for uh, yeah, almost 25 minutes and you know that I'm a little bit nervous. You hear me speaking too fast for, for a start. You hear me swallowing a lot. This is information that you get inconsciously and you know that. If not your machine, you don't have necessarily this information unless you do some machine learning and um, classification of those nonverbal audio events. So here's a little demonstration we recently ran with one of my uh, master degree students. And you'll be looking at one of the classifiers we developed for uh, 13 or 17 uh, nonverbal features uh, that we identified uh, inside the air canal. And here again, missed, sorry. Oops. Oh, 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 oh. So I don't read German, but that one I understand. So that's uh, very troubling. Mm. So you would have to take my word for that. So what uh, happened is that um, he was actually speaking on, in front of his computer, and we would be classifying all the noise he would be doing. So first he would speak that would de be detected as voice, and then you could detect the cl click of the teeth. That's something that is very clear. You can detect the click of the tongue, the swallowing of saliva, and there was uh, the sneezing. And there was also one noise that was really interesting, is that uh, closing the eyes forcefully is actually noisy, and you can pick up, identify that very precisely inside the air canal. So this is the kind of information that was available. And what's funny is that, obviously, you don't necessarily hear all those signals, but if you have machine learning, the features can be very uh, easily uh, extracted, uh, given the proper hints and uh, cues. <coughs> um, so, sorry for that. The um, air canal is not a static place. So you may realize that when you're moving, when you're chewing, when you're uh, speaking, the air canal is changing shape and dimension. So this is something that I will illustrate here with uh, a comparison between two uh, scans that have been done with the open jaw uh, position and the closed uh, jaw position. So in green, that's open jaws. So this is my ear canal. And you see, if I'm uh, now looking into the differences, you will see that there are huge 
uh, displacement when you are moving, opening, and closing your jaws. And you can see here, really, um, on that uh, cut, you can see really that the, at the entrance of the air canal, you have almost one millimeter differences between the open jaw and closed jaw position. And this is not consistent. Sometimes it's opening, sometimes it's closing. It's really independent uh, or subject dependent as well. So the effect of that change in volume and shape, obviously, uh, changes the acoustical response of that cavity. And so uh, there has been, um, there is actually uh, currently a symposium on wearable computers in, in London, as we speak. And one of the Japanese team over there presented a device that simply using, again, the microphone and the speaker inside the ear and measuring the transfer function between the two in the acoustical domains is able to see the difference between open and closed jaw uh, positions. And their claim is that using proper machine uh, learning techniques, they can actually detect all those facial expressions that you see here. So this is with uh, you know, quite a high um, uh, efficiency, and they have a low confusion uh, matrix for, for that. And I'm not sure I agree with their title. I don't think they are all facial expressions, but at least it gives you some information about you know, some of the face and uh, temporal mandibular uh, joint uh, activity. So the last, uh, but not least, uh, again, uh, case for uh, in-ear sensing is obviously electrophysiology. So now, if I'm putting electrodes inside the air canal or around the air canal, I can read, for example, electroencephalography and activities, and all those brain waves that are typically uh, recorded with large uh, scalp systems can be recorded inside the ear. Obviously, you don't have the same density and the same information, but you may have some interesting information. So that has been a quest for several researchers uh, over the last uh, 10 years. And I will just be showing you uh, the very first uh, attempt we made uh, with the curvature uh, on that. And you see here the, um, the earpiece with the uh, behind the ear uh, contour and connected to um, an acquisition system where you can see here three uh, channels, for three channels, the, uh, the EEG uh, activity. And here, that was mostly to see uh, the artifacts you would get uh, from uh, muscular activities. But um, there are a lot of applications that have been uh, successfully done to record auditory evoke potentials or to, just to record the brain oscillations that you typically have, uh, alpha, gamma, and other activities. So that's one, and it leads to a huge uh, number of commercial uh, products. Uh, the latest one that is really very close to <coughs> what we can do is merging audio and EEG. And you see here uh, those earpieces that have those uh, little uh, uh, let's say, capacitive, um, sorry, conductive uh, silicon electrodes. Uh, they are highlighted in, uh, in red on the upper right. And those um, are sensing around the ear. There is nothing inside the ear, but you ha can have sound and sound uh, presentation using those uh, commercial uh, products. So that opens a lot of uh, possible applications, not only for cognitive uh, science and in-situ uh, studies, uh, going in, out of the lab in real life and so on. Uh, that's also very usable uh, even for us at, uh, with you know, very moderate uh, knowledge in those uh, electrophysiological uh, fields because we can develop uh, simple brain-computer interfaces uh, just capturing some very special events uh, that are audio-triggered or not, or even just monitoring some of the um, cognitive workload using those uh, brain oscillations I mentioned. And this is something that can be useful to detect that uh, somebody is overwhelmed by the information or somebody is you know, just too fatigued uh, to work normally and, and so on. So that's um, you know, handy and um, probably... The um, stimulation. So stimulation, you understand that we can uh, listen to a lot of audio stimuli and the ear is perfectly designed for that. Uh, what's a little bit uh, was new for me is that it actually, can be actually triggered with uh, electricity as well. So now if you consider the electrodes I just showed you, and rather than reading electrical signals, you now send electrical signals, what happens is that you can do some uh, direct current stimulation, for example, and here you have um, applications, consumer applications, where they uh, claim that you know, merging that with your audio listening experience could really enhance your whole uh, you know, enjoyment and, uh, and experience. So I don't know, and that wasn't necessarily substantiated by any, uh, any research. But what I know for a fact is that you have the vagus uh, nerve 
that is very close uh, to the air canal, and that there are various nerve uh, therapy that are there to treat by inducing those currents. Uh, they are to treat a, a lot of uh, diseases, you know, ranging from the from depression or even um, epilepsy uh, crisis and so on. So they they are done usually at a lower level, but they could be done uh, in the ear, and so that may be a field of research. And the vagus nerve is obviously a uh, rich is very long. Uh, um, system reaching uh, from, from upper the head down to the gastric system, so it has a, as well a lot of application that can be, uh, that can be f foreseen and pursued. So um, I didn't mention, but again, that's a little bit obvious that uh, you could send vibration as well inside the ear. You know that if I'm shaking your, uh, your ear, the bones will uh, shake, and that sometimes transmits sound to the cochlea. This is the way Beethoven used to uh, listen to his uh, grand piano having a stick uh, uh, connected to the, to the head. So that's another stimulation that I forgot to mention. But the last stimulation I want to uh, illustrate here is actually light. So believe it or not, but if I'm shining a very bright light inside your ear canal, there will be some effect. And that has been actually a study done at, in Ulu, at, in Finland. And they showed that this effect is the same as, be, as you being exposed to a light therapy. So basically, taking all uh, you know, your circadian uh, cycle back in place, having you uh, generate uh, the, the proper uh, you know, neurotransmitters and so on. And that uh, study were run, and that was, I think, interesting, uh, for the jet lag effect. So can you be resynchronized uh, using that light therapy? And that was a double-blind uh, study, and I thought I wanted to, uh, to share the results. And so here is a, a VAS on the y-axis. The VAS is basically uh, everything that goes wrong when you're doing a jet travel you know, with a you know, six hours uh, flight delay, six hours uh, time difference. And so you start at really worse, and you can see that things are going better over the days. But what you can see here is that after four, uh, day number four, you're recovering way faster with this uh, system, the transcranial uh, bright light, uh, as opposed to just the placebo uh, control test, uh, control group that was there. So you're gaining a couple of days uh, through that, and I think that was unexpected. We didn't expect that there would be some uh, you know, neurons that would be photosensitive uh, you know, inside the cranium, but apparently this is the case, and that uh, can be used to some, uh, some advantage. So now to conclude, um, energy harvesting. I think you realize that we want to put a lot of things inside that little earpiece. And uh, a lot of those things are actually uh, battery uh, driven or they need, they need at least some energy, some electrical power supply. And uh, rather than having you changing your batteries and with the uh, cost and uh, convenience uh, and environmental impact, uh, why not uh, having rechargeable system obviously, but why not having you know, extended recharging systems? So uh, rather than uh, being always on your cables and chargers, what if we could harvest locally some energy? So we looked into all the energy sources that were available inside the air canal or around the air canal, so on the head. And uh, so we started with the windmill and the solar panels, you know, but they got really uh, quickly dismissed. And then we realized that the head is a dynamic place, you know, I'm nodding a lot. And you remember that watch that can be recharged, uh, you know, in a mechanical way. So why not using that energy? Well, because it's very uh, low frequency, aperiodic uh, perturbation, so very, and, and high magnitude, so very difficult to harvest in, in MEMS. Um, we look into heat because you realize that this is a warm place and here is cooler, especially in Canada. And so the gradient between the two um, energy sources can give you some electrical power as well. But finally, what we realize is that the ear canal jaw joint movement, again, was the place for a lot of mechanical displacement and mechanical pressure. This is a very strong muscle and why not using that uh, to our benefit? So the very first uh, experiment we ran was simply having uh, this same uh, earplug you've seen, so bladder filled with water here, so it was not cured, it was liquid. And the liquid was uh, moving a little uh, magnetic, um, a little magnet inside the coil, and you would have you know, some induced uh, currents. And um, using that demo, we were here chewing for 16 seconds uh, on a burger or maybe a shungum. And you can see clearly the jaw opening and jaw closing phase and with voltage you know, up to plus or minus five volts with uh, that uh, electrodynamic uh, system. And uh, you could obviously recharge uh, some capacitor if, if you are interested. 
obviously our system was very, very inefficient and uh, that was a very uh, low amount of energy that was uh, collected. Nothing was really optimized, but I can tell you that we had a huge uh, media impact and success on that and I got calls from even uh, chewing gum companies that were interested in buying the first <laughs> prototypes uh, for the next marketing campaign. So I think it's... Uh, so just to prove you that with little energy you can do huge impact. That's the point. Um, so on that note, uh, I think I gave you this overview of the 18 uh, in-ear technologies that we've been contemplating or working on uh, over the last uh, years. You may wonder, you know, how much is real, you know, how much is already done. So for that, I have a little bit of um, the uh, informational slide, which is actually what our industrial partner is uh, putting on the market or has put on the market, which is really a device that looks like this. So you may recognize a lot of the, the feature I've been describing which does the protection, the communication, and some of the monitoring I mentioned about the uh, noise exposure and those uh, bio signals. So everything, uh, considering the, the uh, number three, the last item is probably not completely there, but as for the rest, this is already, uh, you know, has been launched, uh, pre-launched commercially. The uh, pre-launch was quite successful, and I'm still very proud to, um, that we won that very first place at the global here and now competition. That was actually a challenge uh, launched by the Americans that realized at OSHA and NIOSH that it took years, uh, ages, you know, between uh, technologies, um, between the time technologies could actually be out of the lab in the field. And they wanted to really see how things could be accelerated. And we were lucky to uh, have that first position and got really good exposure uh, to the industrial uh, marketplace uh, thanks to that. So you realize this is a lot of things to be done inside the ear. Uh, we cannot do this all along, so we are open uh, for corroboration. So I think a lot of you are experts in those various areas, and uh, we are uh, open for any you know, uh, corroboration or uh, corroborative work that could be done in this. Uh, in one word, we are all ears. And this is my contact information. Thank you very much for your fascinating and very inspiring talk. There are plenty of opportunities for both basic as well as the research, as well as innovation, further innovation. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, more time for discussion because several committees start now. But I would like to thank you and also give you a present from the organizers, Aachen and Finden, who is certainly fantastic. <laughs> you will go. Thank, thank, thank you very much. much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.